We've spoken to a lot of people using differences and differences at Netflix and LinkedIn, these sort of places. It's a popular method because there are plenty of times in which you don't get the chance to A-B test and you want to compare before yeah. and after. And the truth is that A-B test is so much more trustworthy that if you ever have the opportunity to do it, you should definitely do that. And you should reserve mm-hmm. the difference and differences to situations where it's just not possible. Think of yeah. Netflix launching a new show. Like you can't give half the people the show. Hello, everyone. Welcome to the Data Scientist Show. Today we have Che Sharma. A few weeks ago, we talked about A/B testing best practices, and it became one of the most popular episodes. And today, I'm glad to have Che back to the show. So Che was the first data scientist at Airbnb. Later, he joined Webflow as an early employee. In 2021, he founded Apple, a next-gen A/B experimentation platform designed for modern data and product team to run more trustworthy and advanced experiments. I also worked as a data scientist in an experimentation platform while I was at Amazon. I was on the team for three years, and my biggest frustration was when seeing some teams trying to apply tricks to make the results significant, or slice and dice the data to make the metric pretty enough for their launch report. Today, me and Che will go over those toxic behaviors in experimentation culture and provide actionable advice on how to handle those situations and how to have rigor and integrity when designing and analyzing A/B tests. Welcome back to the show, Che. It's good to be back, Daliana. Thanks for having me. So I know many product teams require a significant positive experiment results before they launch a feature. But sometimes they don't have enough statistical power to achieve such results, and that's when people cut corners or manipulate data to show desired outcome. And、uh, this type of behavior really hurts people's trust in experimentation, and they also make bad product decisions. So, what are some typical toxic behaviors you have observed、uh, in experimentation? Yeah, toxic behaviors. I'd say the, the way I think about it is we try to avoid experimentation looking like theater. I've started calling、yeah. it statistical theater. And so the problem here is you do this process, and it has this like kind of smell of science and rigor. But if anyone actually knows how this stuff works, it's just completely noise and nonsense. And this happens all the time. And I think sometimes people think that cutting these corners for the sake of getting some result out is helpful, but usually that kind of destroys the experiment culture over time. So when we talk about removing statistical theater, we think of it really holistically, right? Which is what are you using the right data? Are you testing good hypotheses? Are you applying statistics properly, interpreting it properly? We think of all these different steps and say, in the end, the entire process needs to be stamped as trustworthy. In a way that, like again, you're not going to be undermined down the road. So, previously we talked a little bit about statistical power. Why statistical power matters? Yeah, definitely. I, and I'm glad you brought this up because, in my mind, this is the most common version of statistical theater that there is. So, statistical power is basically like how much signal are you going to get out of the noise,、uh, and it's usually a it's a function of just how variable is the thing you're measuring. And、uh, how much data do you have? The problem I see all the time is people usually they're coming from some large company like a Meta, who believes so holistically in experimentation, and then they go to a bunch of small companies and just you know start trying to force feeding it down a small company. I think that's really destructive, and、uh, I think probably one of the stances that Epo has uniquely taken in, in the experimentation vendor space is saying that if you're a small company with very few data points counted in the hundreds or something, you should. Just not run experiments. I think it's just not a very constructive process, and I, I think, as you might expect, a lot of other vendors will push that. Oh yeah, you should definitely buy us and run more experiments. We're, we're actually a little bit more opinionated about that, and, and the reason is that if you don't have enough data points to get any clear signal on something, it's just much more likely that anything that actually even does show up positive is just pure noise. And if you think about it, every experiment has some sort of I don't know. Five percent or lower, five percent ish sort of false positive rate. It's basically saying at some point the the noise is just going to trigger tripwires of significance. That means if you have low statistical power, it's just much more likely that the stuff you're detecting is that noise as opposed to any true signal. So there's a lot more to it, but I would say that the first test of are you engaging in statistical theater is are you trying to 
graft a unsuitable scientific process into an environment that it just doesn't make sense, such as really small sample sizes. But the big issue here as well is you'll see again, these people trying to suggest small companies run experiments. And if you've ever used sample size calculators, there's a few inputs, right? What is the variance? What is the minimum detectable effect? And what sample size do you have? The, it's hard to turn the knobs on the underlying variance. So people usually try to say, oh, well, maybe we can detect really big effect sizes. What if the metric moves by 30, 40, 50% or something like that? Mm -hmm. And it's a nice thought. Oh yeah. If you're in startup land, you, there's plenty of 50% increases lying around in, in plain sight. And in our experience, I just am not sure that I'm not convinced that's the case. You might be yeah. able to get large 50% changes on some behavioral click metric, but on metrics that people care about, the metrics that ultimately build the culture, it, it's just not very likely. So I, I think it's much more likely that if you do see a 30, 40% increase that it was actually statistical noise and it's not actually a true signal that, that you actually unlock some crazy thing. Yeah, that's a great point. For folks who are not familiar with the, the concept of effect size, so basically that's a quantitative measurement of the difference between your uh, treatment and your control. You also mentioned when people pick metrics, sometimes people might pick a metric that's not very important for the feature, but they know this metric is kind of volatile. So they always see the needle move. Do you have some examples for this type of bad metric design and how can we tackle this? Yeah, I mean, I've seen it all over the place. So basically in an easy way to understand metrics is that you have some kind of core business metric that's upgraded to a paid subscription or activated or purchased the thing. And these are the metrics that if they go up, a business is going to take notice, right? If they go up, then you're going to start reinvesting in that organization, those people, those projects. And then you have a bunch of what I call behavioral metrics, which is they clicked on the widget, they signed up in the app, they did something like that. And as you might suspect, it's easier to move some of these like behavioral metrics than it is the final purchase. And to give you a sense of this, Airbnb for a while, they were measuring the search to contact rate. So this is back in the day, you had to message a host and ask them to if you could stay, and then they said yes. And it was this kind of long process. Thankfully we have instant book now, which clears mm -hmm. the stuff up, but we saw over and over and I would say 80% of the experiments, like the vast majority of experiments that an experiment would inflect that earlier part of the funnel, this kind of search the contact bit, but then the number of hosts who would accept that contact to book thing, and that would actually finally get confirmed would inflect down and the whole thing would net out to, to nothing. It was like the most common pattern we ever saw was that like we had this two stage funnel and you can move one step up and the other step goes down and it nets out to something mm -hmm. even. And so we, we've seen this now across all of our customers, all over the place. It's a super common pattern in funnels is that you move, inflect one stage and then the other stage goes down and that's even. So that, that's where I see there's a sort of tempting thing to say, okay, let's run an experiment on this upstream funnel stage of the funnel which could be fine from a hygiene perspective, make sure nothing's broken, but mm -hmm. it's hard to, the ultimate goal is to build experimentation culture to say, here are the ideas that worked, here are the people worth investing in, the ideas worth investing in. It's just hard to get there when you don't actually have that picture of ultimate impact, of ultimate customer yeah. impact. And so we also talk about sample size. So you mentioned there are calculators to decide what is the optimal uh, sample size. And are there any rule of thumb, like how big is big enough or how small is small? Yeah, I think in general, I, if you think about it, like a lot of these sort of kind of enter funnel to final purchase things are usually, I don't know, they're often around five, 10% or something like that, grossly generalizing across businesses. But I think that's like a, a typical sort of thing. And so I loosely say, if you're kind of dealing with sample sizes in the hundred thousand or more sort of deal, that kind of puts you in a range where like you should start seriously considering on experimentation. If you're somewhere in the 10,000 or 1000, definitely hundred, like it's a little bit more questionable. Now it, some businesses, they might have, let's say 25,000 users uh, going into the app and they actually have a very movable impact metric. And so that's fine. But yeah, these startups that are having like 1,000 or hundreds, like it's very hard to imagine a world in which you are able to have such great impact on your ultimate metric. Yeah. 
And I also have seen people trying to change the significance level to make their results appear significant. What's、yeah. funny about that? In a way, I actually think that's a little bit more honest because at least you're just saying, "Look, I'm just going <laughs> to embrace much higher false positive rates, and I'm going to do it、mm-hmm. in the language of false positive rates." Right? At least that's a little bit more. I think that's actually a fair thing some people would consider. But if you use these sample size calculators, such as ours in the Apple app or any of the ones online, you'll quickly realize that going from a 0.05 to 0.1 significance level, it nudges you up, but it doesn't change the game nearly as much as the metric variance and the effect size. Yeah. A lot of people, when they change significance level, they're not aware of how it affects whether their experiment will be false positive or not. Without doing a meta analysis on their previous experiments. So, for if an organization is running a lot of experimentation, how can they、uh, figure out what is their false positive rate? Yeah, I mean, figuring out the false positive rate. The true false positive rate is, you know, honestly, a pretty difficult. Which is one of the insidious parts about it is if you're cutting a bunch of corners on false positives, the way you're ultimately going to undermine is not because the true false positive rate comes out. It's just that you, at that point, claim so many victories, and people don't feel like the impact is showing up on ultimate metrics. And、right. so that's sort of where I'm getting at, where it's like. It, it's bad for the culture because, like, it feels good in the short term. You get to claim you did all these great things, and then there's going to come some reckoning a, a year or two when some CPO or someone in, in the seat of making investments is going to say, "This team claimed to move a metric like ten percent or twenty percent、mm-hmm. or something in total across all these experiments," and yet it doesn't seem like this is showing up. There are techniques like holdout groups. So basically, what you do is. You take some long-term control group that is outside of all the experiments, and then you compare it to all the winning variants and all the experiments. That's one way you can try to get at some honesty here, but even that requires a lot of sample size. So it gets back into: it, it, should you be engaging with AB experimentation seriously before your hundred thousand users? It's more of a question. But the if you were to actually gauge the false positive rate, what you'd probably do is just rerun a lot of experiments and just see、yeah. did those effects actually hold up on rerunning.、Right. And sometimes I also seen teams when one experiment is not statistically significant, they will just run the same experiment over and over again until yeah. it becomes significant. Yeah, I mean,、uh, the the things we see in, again in terms of statistical theater is、mm-hmm. you set up some experiment, it's meant to move this metric, and everyone's aligned on that, and then it doesn't, and then、yeah. some places and some tools. Will encourage people to go find some metric that did move, and then start、mm-hmm. claiming that as a win. This actually happened to me when I first joined Webflow. I was working with a PM who we running these onboarding experiments, and it was all in all very neutral. It did have this one thing though, where people were upgrading and then canceling really quickly, and then kind of with, without even us realizing it, the PM kind of reported that we increased the upgrade rate. Like it. it <laughs> This thing is like it was leaving out an important detail that they all canceled it right after, and so you,、mm-hmm. you see this that if you if this is part of why we're of the opinion that there should probably be some core group that is defining the important metrics for the business and the decision framework of these are the ones that matter. Make sure experiment reports speak to them.、Um, if your experiment infra is fragmented and manual enough that there's no control over what metrics people pick, then you're kind of in danger of that sort of scenario. Yeah. So,、uh, how about we went from the beginning of experiment design and then talk about what are some best practices in each steps?、Uh, for example, you you mentioned having a good framework is important. So, in the experimentation design phase, when you are choosing your metrics or your、um, sample, what are some best practices we should follow? Yeah, there's a few of them. So. Suppose you're some new experiment culture. The and suppose you actually have sample size to do stuff. The failure pattern I see most often is that people only take big swings. They start、mm-hmm. saying, "Let's run one big experiment. It's a highly visible, highly public thing. It's going to take I don't know four months to develop, and we're, that's going to be the experiment we're running. Maybe one other one." And I think that's actually a, a big failure mode if you're just getting started. And the reason is that you have a lot of muscles that need to develop in terms of running experiments.、And、what's most likely going to happen is that those two experiments are going to be neutral or negative, not least because of the hypothesis themselves might be flawed, but 
also because your design might be bad, your data integrity might be bad, or it's just going to take more iteration. And so it sets you up to optically look bad to say you worked all this time and then didn't move a metric. And that was a lot of money to spend on this new growth team. So I usually encourage people, if you're first starting getting started, aim for a quantity of experiments more than a large op visible experiment. Get to 10, 20 experiments as fast as possible. Because here's what you're going to figure out. You're going to launch these experiments and you're going to quickly realize there is some customer segment who you are not thinking about when you design experiments. For example, when we were at Webflow, when we just started experiments, it was pretty clear that the designers, the product team were not thinking about the teams using Webflow. There's a skew called teams where there's people collaboratively building websites. It's just a different, different workflow, different uh, product lifecycle. And it was just not top of mind. And so we'd run these growth experiments and overall it might be like neutral positive, but it was just failing on these things, which once you see it, it's like clearly obvious why it would fail. Now, if you spent, as this team did, four months building the thing, again, it just looks like the team is not executing well because you'd spent all this time and then there's this big bug and you gotta go fix it and go back to the well sort of thing. So there could be just some customer segmentation that's just completely out of whack would be one thing. Yeah. Another thing that might happen is, again, if you're especially building a lot of in-house experiment infra, you might find that there's some issue with your instrumentation. You're not getting the right data out to know who is in what group. Or maybe there's some traffic imbalance where there's a bias because more people are in one group than another. There's just a lot of kind of machinery in running an experiment where the good thing is once you get good tooling, you can have confidence in it. But early on, just get a lot of shots on goal because you, you're going to want to quickly get through these execution issues. You're going to want to quickly get some learnings. And then from there, at least the leadership team is like, here's a team that is at least like trying a lot of stuff out and learning quickly. And I actually have a little bit more faith that they're going to eventually get to some big wins. Yeah. So start with low impact experiments and testing the features that even if you ignored some segment, it's not going to be a big failure and you learn yeah. from well, those. Well, I, I do want to push it. It's not the word low impact, because I think one mm -hmm. of the things you learn in this business is and part of the reason yeah. why I like this, why I like this framework of go small, small experiments first is that small changes can lead to big impact. We've all seen it at every company, yeah. it's a seemingly small thing that reduces friction in just the right way or can lead to huge results. I know Ronnie Kohabi wrote in his book about the famous Bing ad experiment where they just made it so that the wrapping text was appended to the title or something like that. It was just the, like a very small change that led to 13% increase in revenue. And they, and yeah. that 13% held up in replication over and over. It was like a real thing. So mm -hmm. the small changes, you might end up with a home run in there. I would yeah. say that what you do need to do though, early on is in terms of engineering time, in terms of product time, like aim for a lot of experiments that take, I don't know, a week or two to build small number of time, mm -hmm. small amount of time, small changes. I, I think that's what I mean by aim for a quantity of experiments more than some large complex project. Maybe it's low risk. So you can test a different font or like slightly different shade of color requires not a lot of effort from engineering team. And also yeah. customers not just going to hate on your website when you make some small changes. Like totally. It's an interesting balance to strike, right? Cause mm -hmm. again, if you have good experiment infra, no reason not to try some of these small red, blue button color things, yeah. but it's also again, put yourself in leadership shoes. You have this new growth team. You hired some director from a fancy company and they asked for all these resources and you stood it up. And then after a few quarters, what you see is a big pile of let's turn the red to a pink and the font to another one sort of thing. I don't think you necessarily come out of that feeling good. And maybe some big change came out of that, but it just optically looks a little weird. Is that what growth is? I, I think you do want to be hypothesis driven. You do want to have some theory of, can I reduce friction over here? Can I increase excitement over there? Is there some way to kind of drive people down a funnel or to do this, adopt this behavior? That like at least makes some sense. Yeah. I, mean, I, I do think though that like you can come up with those hypotheses and come up with these two week experiments pretty easily. If you just sit down with a designer, walk through your app and just say, here's a step that I did. Do we really need to do that? Can we just not do that? Or maybe you can do things like here's a bunch of form fills. Can we just add some smart defaults just so mm -hmm. it's basically already filled and they're only adding one thing. There's a lot of these things that, or just add a badge saying here's an item that is highly desirable. You should do it. I remember one of the things at Airbnb, we were working on the instant book feature to get more hosts to sign up and do instant book. 
there was a lot of power in just sentences saying, hey, hosts who get who sign up for Instant Book get 50% more revenue or something like that. It's, it's basically just copy that you're adding that just kind of reinforces the excitement. And at yeah. least it's a little bit more hypothesis driven. It's just saying we believe if people, as they're going through this somewhat high friction form fill, like we're reminded about why they're doing it, then maybe they'll do it more. And so mm -hmm. that, that's what I'd say is you should still aim to be a little bit hypothesis driven yeah. at those early stages, but you can still find these two week projects. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And uh, a lot of times we have a lot of ideas. We have a lot of hypotheses. So do you have a framework to prioritize what are the hypotheses we want to test first? And then, yeah. or we don't have any good ideas. We want to test something. Where do we find those good hypotheses? Yeah. 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 I mean, this is the actual product part of it, right? It doesn't even have anything to do with experimentation. It has to do yeah. with just product planning in general. So all the same product prioritization frameworks, right? Like how many people like reach this point of the flow you're talking about, any sort of UX research that can guide you, talking to customers, whatever it is, data analysis showing that there's a big drop off here. And if we could narrow that, mm -hmm. there'd be a lot of lift. These, these sorts of things are always very good. I do think it's also worth thinking with your team, are you ideas constrained? Are you kind of sample size constrained or are you engineering constrained? And basically yeah. the set of things you build depends on your answers to those things. So if you only have the ability to test out so many things out of, you have some pretty hacky infra that's a little painful to deal with, or the growth team only has two engineers or something like that. Some of these starts very small, then of course you have to be a little bit more choosy. But yeah. again, if you have ample engineering resources and ample sample size, again, if you're working at an Airbnb or a Met or something like that, you can test a lot of ideas. You can mm -hmm. actually just, you'll, you'll probably run out of ideas first. That's so that, that yeah. that's a very different place to be. Yeah. So, okay. Now we have a good hypothesis. We follow the best practices, set up the experiment. And while the experiment is running, what are some best practices we should stick to and avoid statistical theater during this phase? Yeah. I mean, the main thing you're trying to do here is you want to make sure that the operation of the experiment is still healthy. That's a healthy experiment. And yet you don't want to for people to be jumping on results early and peaking. So mm -hmm. to give you a sense, the vast majority of experiment programs use these statistical tests called T-tests, or they might use some Bayesian methods with uninformative priors. That's a, a bit more of a technical thing, but for the purpose, just understand uninformative priors and Bayesian is literally the exact same thing as a T-test. And so for T-tests, you're making a promise that you're not gonna look at the results until the end. You're not gonna make a decision until the end, which is nearly unfeasible for every company I've ever worked in. To give you a sense, when I was at Webflow, we launched this experiment that it was swapping out billing infrastructure. And this is a big, highly sensitive thing. Anytime you touch the big money machine, people get nervous, right? And so yeah. we were looking at the subscription metric. And again, it was pretty low power for just the rollout plan led to some low power, but it was showing like a 10% drop in booking and, and, and subscription revenue. Mm. As you can expect, this made people freak out, right? The company cannot have a 10% drop in subscription revenue. So yeah, good luck telling people not to peak at, at the T-test when there's a 10% drop. So that's something where, you know, what we encourage everyone to do is use these methods called sequential testing, which is mm -hmm. designed to deal with a peaking problem. What it basically says is instead of using a fixed window and saying you're only going to look at it at the end, Instead, use a continuous window where it's, we're going to assume you're looking at, you're looking at the results every single day and we're going to modify the, the decision boundaries accordingly. So this is, I think just at EPO, we believe a lot in the sort of real politique of experimentation, which is there's a theorized ideal that a lot of people don't hit. And then there's the real kind of actions of an organization acting in, under uncertainty. And one of our statements is that it's probably more likely you're dealing with people peaking their results and launching results early than you are mm -hmm. a lot of the other statistical issues. So yeah. we always recommend that even as we also offer t-tests and Bayesian methods for people who want them. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And if they have some, say, guardrail met metrics that they want to observe to make sure the revenue or sign up doesn't drop significantly, how do they make sure that doesn't hurt the um, customer experience too much uh, yeah. during, the, during experimentation. 
Yeah, definitely. So yeah, I mean, this is again, something infrastructure can do for you is just have guardrails so that if an experiment is really driving down a metric you care about, it, ideally you can be proactively told in Slack and email or something like that and say your mm -hmm. guardrail is going down, have a look at it. Um, another thing you can do, and again, it's one of the benefits of these sequential methods is that because it's continuous monitoring, if you get to the end of the experiment and suppose it shows that you have a significant lift on your primary metric, but you have a non-significant, but sort of concerning effect on a guardrail metric you care about. One option is to choose to just keep running the experiment longer, mm. right? Which is again, if you're a continuous monitoring method, that's completely valid. And so what you might do is just let it run for another few weeks and see if that negative result on your guardrail metric turns into a significant negative result if it actually becomes a real thing. Yeah. So that, that's one of the ways you might think about guardrail metrics. And the other is it's a class of problems called heterogeneous treatment effects, which is a very long set of words for kind of user segmentations and use case mm -hmm. segmentations where again, it might be a healthy experiment overall, but there's a certain app version that is broken, that is bad. Yeah. And so it's very important as you're monitoring the results that you have access, ideally proactively, but if not reactively to be on, being able to split the results by various things, just because you could be completely in the red on some sort of segment because of a bug. And so, mm -hmm. you know, the worst thing is you get to the end, you waited four weeks for this experiment to run, and it turns out the whole thing is garbage because some user segment actually takes the whole thing. Now we finish the experiment and we start to analyze the results. And besides the primary metrics we picked, what are some other analysis you recommend um, people to look at? And also what are some other possible statistical theater yeah. that might happen during this phase that we need to be aware of? Yeah, I mean, this one's deep with it, right? This is where a lot of, a lot of people can try different things. So yeah. I, I think this is again where ideally your infrastructure reinforces this, but there should be some general organization idea of how do you make decisions in product. Mm -hmm. Again, here are the metrics we care about. And so if you have not harmed the metrics you care about and you've, then you basically are allowed to kind of do what you want. Like if you have lifted metrics you care about, then you might additionally get celebrated or you have the knowledge shared or whatever. That, that's ideally how it should work is that there's some idea of like, here are the metrics that matter that we make decisions around. Now, a lot of experiments end up neutral and that's fine. And in a lot of ways, like if you've done this process, right, where you picked a valid hypo hypothesis that fail, the hypothesis failing doesn't work is actually instructive, then that's actually a good piece of knowledge to share as well. Is we thought removing friction in this flow would have like really affected the metric, but you know, we tried three different ways of doing that and nothing really moved the needle. And so we're going to start poking around a different hypothesis instead. So that, that's the key thing of ideally how it should work. Now, the statistical theater part happens is when you start cherry picking metrics and you're like, oh, it didn't affect overall subscriptions, but it did improve mobile purchases in China or something. You, mm -hmm. you pick some segment and then you hold it up being like, we definitely did something here. Yeah. And as the statistics show, if you start just looking at a lot of metrics, it's again, so much more likely that you're going to find noise and start to celebrate it. So that's one piece of things you, you should do. And then the second is it's always worth looking at these segments of so saying, let's look at it across geographies, across time zones, across devices, any other use cases, interesting segments. And this is less for deciding what to launch and what to celebrate and more for just guiding future hypotheses. If you dig into those, it's always good to kind of put it in the back of your head and say, is there any underlying trend? And this, the good thing is that when you're talking about just generating ideas, the bar for rigor is just much lower because it's what you're going to apply rigor to is the judgment of those next ideas, not the like yeah. kind of ideation and brainstorming period. Mm -hmm. So th that's kind of some of the stuff we see most often is kind of cherry picking of results to share with the rest of the org. Mm -hmm. And uh, sometimes data scientists might have the pressure from their managers or some decision makers having to give them a number so they can put in a report. So as a data scientist, how do we push back? How do we say no to the 
performing yeah. in the theater. Yeah, this is a tough thing because it, the funniest thing about this is that if an experiment doesn't work, it basically just turns into a lot of work for the data scientist who now has to like go dive into every single cut, every single funnel, every yeah. single slice dice. And I actually think that's not so bad. Again, the statistical theater part happens is when you start like disseminating and this cherry picking ex exercise, right? Once you start doing that and trying to treat it like proven knowledge, like if this is a bunch of sanity checks to make sure that it was actually that the hypothesis wasn't working and it wasn't due to some bug, that's completely valid. And I think PMs are right to ask for those numbers. And again, ideally your infrastructure makes it fast. If it's mm -hmm. something where we just want to check if there are any trends to inform how we go about things in the future, maybe we should prioritize mobile over desktop implementations or something like that. Then again, fair cuts to have. You just have to make sure that if you notice some trend, you're not like over-reporting it and sending it to the CPO or something and saying the whole thing was neutral or negative, but we found this actually interesting impact that we had. You don't want to get that twisted. So as a data mm -hmm. scientist, kind of how do you push back on it? Well, one is um, ideally you have built a relationship with these PMs to the point where they can, it's a working relationship and you can kind of say statistically, it's not a good idea to do these sorts of things. I'm happy to give you numbers, but I am communicating to you that they should be interpreted this way. This is very helpful if you have an embedded model in your kind of full-time partnering with the team for some sort of like agency model, yeah. ticket queue thing, which is a whole separate conversation we can have. But I also think it's, it's something where like the way you build reports should kind of enforce a certain kind of consistency and garter rails around the cherry picking so that, well, look, here's a typical report template. We're going to ask you for these things. And that is the main headline. Feel free to talk explorations into the appendix, but the core, like what do we make of this thing is going to be somewhat opinionated. Yeah. And how do you come up with a good template for the reporting? Because sometimes if you want to go deeper, there can be so many metrics and the p-values for stakeholders that could be overwhelming. But if you report too little, some people don't have an idea of what has been tested. So how do we design reports? Definitely. And as you probably saw, we launched EPO reports this past week. This is all super top of mind. I'm actually super passionate about experiment reports. I feel like it's the sort of thing where us number crunchers and statisticians like grossly underestimate how important reports are. And the reason is that all these sorts of kind of thoughtful hypothesis generation, a product well executed and careful reasoning, like that's all kind of well known for the people on say the growth team or on the experiment team. But you have to kind of evangelize the scientific process you just went through and kind of help storytell it, um, make it seem like this is a really valid and encouraged way of doing product work in a way that like it's going to fit into someone's promotional packet when it comes time for promotions. Like I think that's yeah. when you extend experiment reports to not just a sort of functional trans transmitting of information and more into we're trying to reinforce a culture of science and reinforce the scientists at the company. And so how do you come up with a good report? The way I think about it is one, it need, the reports need to be highly visible, which means you, they need to live on the places leaders live, which is email, Slack, Notion docs, Google docs sort of thing. Like basically it shouldn't require like logging into some piece of tech infra that these people don't ever log into. Yeah. And so that's step number one, meet people where they are. Step number two, there has to be consistency because like the, one of the things that I think is very underestimated is if one team reports this way and another team reports this way and another team reports this way, there's just a lot of cognitive load you're pushing onto any sort of mm. leader who's overseeing all three groups in yeah. a way that kind of collectively erodes trust across all three. So before they even started reading the content of what you're doing, they're already trying to like orient themselves around, is this a report that's trying to sell me in cherry pick, or is this a report that is a very honest brokering way of doing this. So yeah. consistency is number two. And then mm -hmm. number three is you need to be able to storytell in a way that gives context where if you think through this experiment, it's not just a pile of metrics. It's also what led you to do this. Literally, what are we talking about? What is the change? But screenshots and stuff are very helpful here. Just files to actually understand what is the difference of what you did. You need that sort of context before you actually start judging like how did it do. 
And then when it finally comes down to the metrics, it should be a small, focused, narrow set and highly opinionated, dictated from the top. Again, here are the metrics that matter. Leaders should, same deal with consistency, should start to seeing the same metrics across all the experiments, across all the pots. Whereas, okay, here's how it affected all of my core metrics. And again, all these kind of deeper dives, other behavioral stuff, your funnels, your slice dices, all your explorations, anything that's besides those core metrics can be pushed to another section, something like an appendix, something like an exploration, something like that. But at least this kind of core one pager takeaway thing looks the same across all the pods. It provides context. It is accessible in Slack on a phone or something like that. That's how we mm -hmm. think about reports. And it's heavily informed how we built reports in EPO. Yeah, I think it's uh, very important to have consistency. And also some larger companies, for example, Amazon, there might be some organization like Prime Video. In this stage, they are focusing on how many people viewing a video or say Prime is subscription. Maybe it's very different from people working in like retail website, thinking about purchase. Mm -hmm. So for different type of product teams, how do they maintain the consistency while also talking about their own story? Yeah, it definitely it depends on the scope of practice you're talking about. Like Amazon is a very large, diverse beast, right? Spanning mm -hmm. from book sales to, you know, EC2 instances, right? So it's yeah. very, very different things. I, I think that the reporting structure is there. I mean, I, I'm actually curious of your take of how this should be managed. But yeah, I, my, if you follow the same general principles of you want to meet people where they are, you want a consistent report so that leadership can never has to orient themselves and that allows some ability to storytelling what you did. In terms of the metrics, my guess is that it should start off with, again, these sort of core guardrail metric concepts that are relevant to what we're talking yeah. about here. So maybe the book sale business doesn't need to show the EC2 instance metrics, mm -hmm. but you might maybe want a, a one page kind of annex or whatever some like a, a one one page thing that's okay here's the kind of total amazon core metrics thing see how they're moving so you can confirm to yourself nothing's changing yeah and then explorations that, if i'm spitballing that's probably how i'd go about it i think if you've worked in any sort of culture that wasn't like 100 percent bought into experimentation from the start you've had to deal with these general questions of why aren't more teams running experiments? Why aren't leaders giving more credence to experiment results? Why aren't mm -hmm. we getting more investment into this other approach to product? And I think those people are just vastly underestimating the power of reports in yeah. thinking of a platformized, centralized approach to them that both gives a sense of trustworthiness, a sense of link always in sync with single source of truth, and then the ability to evangelize and, and market yourself. So yeah. I, I think the, the actual answer to how do you make good reports is mm -hmm. probably remarkably simple, just consistency and include this sort of information. But the investment in making that into a really high fidelity, powerful thing where the experiment report looks as glossy as the product marketing around some team shipping a product. It looks as yeah. visually compelling. I think that stuff goes a long way. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Also, I think if you have this consistent framework structure of report is easier for data scientists to do meta-analysis, to do an audit of all the mm -hmm. experiments in the past year, whether you want to see uh, some pattern or understand a false positive rate. And from your experience, if I want to audit my past experiments, what are some things I should look for? Yeah, I, this is kind of a big unsolved problem in experimentation, which again drove our need to invest in EPO reports. But mm -hmm. the state of art today is people curate reports in Google Docs or Notion or whatever else, which all makes sense. It's a logical way to do it. But the problem with these tools is they don't allow very easy views of what are all the experiments I ran and what did I learn. You kind of have to go into every single doc and read every single doc, which is yeah. a, a level of effort that's just not really going to happen. So this, we saw this at Airbnb on a different problem on kind of deep analysis in Jupyter notebooks and R markdowns, sort of one-off strategic analyses. And what we ended up doing is building this tool called the knowledge repo, mm -hmm. which ended up getting unanimously adopted across the data team. And it, what it basically did was say, I know you are doing some one-off exploration for your PM, but we're going to now wrap it with this CLI tool that's going to take that analysis and index it in a knowledge repository that's like super discoverable, searchable, visually compelling, has some light social features and stuff in it. 
And so mm -hmm. it was nice because it was not that much more work, but you ended up with this asset that was long lived that you could look back on in time and kind of have all the relevant information you want. So the code was right in there, just like a notebook. And it was all very easy to trust because it went through a GitHub peer review. And so any sort of like obviously wrong thing might've been caught. And this was huge, right? Because suddenly this type of work, which otherwise would be thought of as what did your team of very expensive data scientists like do all year, right? And it sounds like yeah. you just made a couple of dashboards and but what, what happened here is no, I swear we investigated some important questions that like affected things. And mm -hmm. okay, maybe, I don't know. But when you have this stuff in this kind of high fidelity asset that you can look back on and say, here's the 10 things we investigated and the ones that yielded cool opportunities and the others that didn't go anywhere, it just transforms that conversation. And actually the thing that always stuck with me about the knowledge repo project is that it was obviously very good for canonizing knowledge, but it was most useful for middle managers to get their data scientists promoted. Like it was yeah. just for people doing this type of work, it let them actually stand out and say, look, they're doing some really high quality stuff. Look at these visualizations, mm -hmm. look at this and stuff you can, and you know what we ended up shipping later and know that all this stuff is likely rooted in this post. So yeah, that, that what stuck with me is that again, if you think about the sort of real world situation, these experiment cultures exist in, it's not just the process of iterating on product and shipping good features. It's a dynamic organization that is always thinking about what to invest in and what not to invest in. Yeah. And on the promotion part, I, I think it's uh, very interesting because a lot of time when we help product managers do some analysis, the communication is in a Slack me message, in an email. Mm -hmm. It's so hard to track when you talk about, oh, what have I done? I felt I have done a lot of things, but I can't find them. <laughs> Totally. And then all you end up in the promotion packet is cool. We got a couple paragraphs from your PM partner who said that you're always on time and you finish your work and mm -hmm. you do cool analysis and think of all the work you actually did on those things, clean the data to investigate all these different directions and kind of cause like that all kind of gets condensed into some small pithy cross-functional statement. So yeah, you know, there really is so much more to like actually having these durable, shareable, beautiful assets to mm -hmm. build the culture. Yeah. And say I'm a data scientist. I look at the past experiments and I did some calculation. I realized my false positive rate is say 5%. And then the uh, ratio of significant experiment is 6%. So yeah. uh, I realized, oh, maybe this is just an example. So maybe this data scientist realized a lot of experiments might be false positive. They made decisions over the past year based on a lot of noise. Now, when they plan their next year's experimentation, um, what are some changes they need to do in their experimentation yeah. design or framework? Totally. I think there's a couple things that should be examined there. So with a success rate of 6% or something like that, where it's like on the order of the sort of p-value threshold you're operating at, I think the big thing you've got to do is either improve the quality of the experiments and increase your win rate, which is heavily related to how you do product prioritization. Are you picking the right problems, places that have a real sense that they might have opportunity there? And then yeah. the second thing is you can raise the bar of what is considered significant, right? Just most concretely by lowering the p-value, but you can also do mm. something like all the wins, we're going to rerun them. And mm. this is actually Ronnie Kohavi, who was at Airbnb for a bit. He came after I had already left, but we had, he had mentioned this on his interview with Lenny's podcast that the search ranking team, Airbnb at that point had like really kind of gotten a lot of little hanging through and they were having more trouble finding wins and their success rate was on the order of 6-7%. So what he did is he would make every win get rerun, do a replication run on all the wins. And mm. so that kind of... So the good thing about that 6% of search ranking experiment wins is that they were kind of closer to a true rate because they actually held up under reruns. So, you know, th those are basically your two options. If you have a success rate that is close to a sort of false positive signal to noise rate, then you can either try to increase your win rate by better ideas, which as you can tell, I think it's easier said than done, but you know, mm -hmm. that's something you should think about. Or alternatively, which is a much more actionable thing, is to say, every time you have a win, rerun it. Yeah. Know, see if mm -hmm. it holds, holds up again. 
And、uh, we also talk about sometimes when your sample size is、uh, too small or you have very low statistical power, maybe you shouldn't run A/B test. So, so sometimes product managers have to make a decision. You have to move、yeah. forward. What are some alternatives to A/B test、um, people can use to make decisions? Yeah, definitely. I mean, it's, I'm glad you asked because now I run a B two B company which does not have consumer company sample sizes. Yeah.、And、so. What we think about all the time is one is you've got to make sure the app is working, and so you have your engineering metrics around latency, uptime, whatever. But two is a lot of qualitative approaches. You can just literally talk to customers and have get a lot of signal out of that. That that sort of thing is a more likely to lead to real signal than noise. Then I think an A/B test under small sample size.、Uh, a lot of times we also have situations where. There's a network effect. For example,、uh, if Airbnb introduce some new search ranking algorithm, and then maybe one user with some listing can affect experience of other yeah. users. Yeah. So, what kind of other causal inference method we can apply in those type of cases when we want to compare、uh, the treatment effect? Yeah, I'm glad you brought it up because this is something that's very top of mind for us. We again, our mission here is to eliminate statistical theater. With A/B testing situations where A/B testing is a good fit, there's kind of like a well-known set of ways to mitigate those risks: data quality checks, statistical checks, appropriate choice of methods, kind of in a more opinionated way to do launch decisions. But there's a bunch of questions through where, for a variety of reasons, they might not be amenable to A/B tests. So you alluded to one, which is if you're a marketplace. There's some microplaces which just have a lot of interference between users. The classic one is a social network, say like a LinkedIn, where if one user has access to a new kind of emoji or something,、mm-hmm. they're going to put that emoji. Other people probably should see that emoji, right? Like you can't、yeah. isolate it to the one person. And、right. so there, there's a bunch of situations like that. And the answers to how do you control the The rigor of those situations can end up being a little bit bespoke. So if you're LinkedIn,、mm-hmm. the social network situation I'm talking about, you try to find something you can randomize by that you have a little bit more trust in it. So I know they spend a lot of time coming up with clusters, network clusters, which have a lot of like within group connections and not as many out of group connections, and then you randomize those. That's one way to do it. And there's still some interference, but you kind of by design come up with the least amount of interference. Another thing you often see is geographies. So at Airbnb,、yeah. we knew that our host supply was always like pretty low supply compared to demand, and so there was a lot of chance of cannibaliz- cannibalization there, where a treatment arm might just be stealing bookings from the control arm. And so for、mm-hmm. those, what we did is often randomized by market, randomized New York, Paris, London, SF, all the way down. And ran- randomized at that level, with the understanding that like it's very hard for a Paris booking to cannibalize a New York one, right? You know, is the general statement. And so w- there are kind of ways like that to kind of reduce the interference. And then again, there's sort of a long tail of like where do you go from there? One of the cool studies that just came out of Air Me fairly recently was by Ramesh Jahari, one of the best causal inference researchers, and he basically showed that him and his team, to be clear, showed that you can kind of randomize both. Guests and listings in Airbnb, and then do kind of think of your treatment arm as the situations in which both both the guest and the listing are are、mm-hmm. in the treatment group, and then kind well, of. Oh,、so、you have two kind of random right units.、Now. Yeah. Exactly. So there, there's kind of interesting bespoke approaches like that. So、mm-hmm. we're very excited to be diving into that. We have a stats reading group every Friday, where we're always、yeah. reviewing kind of these methods and papers, always with an eye of what can we platformize into Epo, but also what is exciting out there to connect、mm-hmm. with our community on. Yeah, you talk about randomizing cities like New York, Paris, LA, but those cities can also be、um, very different. So,、yes. did you create some、uh, sort of matching scores to construct a, a counterfactuals? How do you make sure、uh, you're ram- randomizing those cities correctly? Yeah, definitely. And so there's a bunch of methods in here. So what we did is we used a method called synthetic controls.、Mm-hmm. So with this, you basically you know, you come up with two sets of markets that, like, if you were to do weighted averages of them, they would closely approximate each other. 
how do you come up with these two sets? There are a variety of ways to do it. One way we did was to come up with a basic distance metric and say, how close are these markets, both in like literal geographic distance, but also in, in like market size in their case mix of the type of travel they do. And then you might end up with pairings like London and Paris, cause they're both global cities with lots of tourism. But then you also might end up with kind of small vacation cities being put as comparable to each other. And so from there, you can kind of create these pairwise sets and randomize and then do synthetic controls over them. These sorts of methods can, again, require a little bit more expertise to use, but we're pretty happy. We're pretty excited to dive into, is there a way to platformize them in a way mm -hmm. that is rigorous, trustworthy, avoiding any sort of statistical theater? Yeah. Um, there's a kind of deep world of here when you're talking about any sort of experiment that sort of has an opt-in to the experiment and then a measurement of the experiment that in the mm -hmm. opt-in step kind of causes kind of distortions. There's these methods called doubly robust estimators, which like, are kind of old and been used all over the place and are pretty trustworthy. So yeah. again, for anyone interested in this stuff, we have a stats reading group every Friday, but we encourage you to check out the LinkedIn posts and are always happy to chat about it. Awesome. Have you used uh, difference in difference when you measure uh, an effect in Airbnb or some other projects? Totally. Yeah, we've used difference and differences. And that's in something as well that we're taking a close mm -hmm. look at to see if there's a platformizing approach to it. Differences and differences for just the audience knows is you basically sort of take a before after picture kind of immediately before immediately after. And then you have to do a similar thing to the synthetic controls as reweighting to make sure each group is, looks like each other. And then there's some kind of diagnostic checks. Like you want to make sure these two groups are kind of moving in parallel up until that moment in time, such that after that moment in time of your launch or whatever it is, that any difference is likely due to the change you introduced. Now, the thing with difference and differences is you have to make sure people aren't kind of abusing the system. Because for example, if you did a product launch on Christmas, there's no amount of statistical controls you can do to account for, it's probably a Christmas effect sort of thing. Right. And when yeah. you carry that over into all the various things that could be happening simultaneously, you have to be a little careful, but there are ways to kind of get yourself a little bit more trust. So it's, it's kind of an interesting thing. We've spoken to a lot of people using differences and differences at Netflix and LinkedIn, these sort of places. It's a popular method because there are plenty of times in which you don't get the chance to A-B test and you want to compare before yeah. and after, but there's also some misgivings in that you can over, you can overly use these things and abuse them. Mm -hmm. So you have to make sure that there's some amount of expertise involved in setting them up. Yeah. What are some cases when you see people abuse it? I think the, the biggest one I see is you have some product launch and there's so much reason why a team would want to not run the AB test instead, just be oh. like, let's just ship it to everyone and do a bunch of product marketing work around it. Yeah. And so long as the only way to get a measurement is the AB test, they're probably going to have to do it because they, they need some amount of measurement. But mm -hmm. then you introduce this other thing, this difference and difference thing that seemingly yeah. is this like, oh, maybe we don't have to do the AB test and we can use this other method. And the truth is that the AB test is so much more trustworthy that if you ever have the opportunity to do it, you should definitely do that. And you should reserve mm -hmm. the difference and differences to situations where it's just not possible. Think of yeah. Netflix launching a new show. Like you can't mm -hmm. give half the people the show. You have to kind of release it to everyone. And that's a kind of more, a, a better setting in our mind than here is just a normal product launch that I've decided to not run as an A-B test and instead try to use some advanced method. Yeah, that's a great point because when you do either synthetic control or difference in difference, those are common causal inference methods uh, people use in data science teams. But how you design those methods sometimes can be subjective. And if you really want to justify an idea, maybe you can pick a model to make some trajectory that fitting to your narrative. However, if you design a good A-B tests, more trustworthy. Totally. I think the big thing about working in technology industry is that you can actually affect the launch process and the data process. Mm -hmm. you know, there's so many kind of econometric methods, which were built because the economists had to like, had no control over those things. You right. know, maybe they're brought in on a consulting job where the launch already happened and they have to mm -hmm. say, okay, how did it work? And it's well, Ideally, we would have run the hippie test, but I guess I got to bring out some econometrics methods to deal with the fact that we didn't. Or it's like a policy thing where it's the launch of Obamacare is not going to go 
the way an economist might want it to in this controlled rollout thing. Mm -hmm. So instead, you just have to find some kind of artificial events like a state just decided to expand Medicaid or something, and then you have to break out the econometrics methods. But yeah. here in tech, we have this awesome situation where a data scientist is right in the loop on the product team, and they can kind of help guide everyone to use the actual precise tools that are very trustworthy. Yeah. So you have been working in the experimentation industry for almost over 10 years. And so what are some trends you observed from the beginning to like now today? Definitely. I think the big thing I've noticed is people have been running experiments since, I don't know, the 2000s or something. You saw it show up in mm -hmm. Google and Microsoft and a few of those places. Yeah. And then it was still like a pretty narrow set. Fun fact, Netflix was running experiments even before they got into the software business. Yeah. Even when they were just like a DVD mailing business, they were running A-B tests, which kind of speaks to how much leadership believed in that stuff. Mm. So back then you saw a pretty narrow set of players kind of doing it and showing some great success. And then I think in the 2010s, you started to see it mainstreamed one additional increment where suddenly it was this next generation of hot companies, the Airbnbs, the Groupons, the Dropboxes, these sorts of places running a lot of experiments. And it was still perhaps not completely widespread, but, you know, Optimizely was out there selling. And so at least the marketers were getting a little bit of experimentation exposure. I think mm -hmm. the trends I'm seeing right now is that there's been a real fanning out of all that culture. We're now in kind of the, the third stage where... It's an extremely mainstream activity where, you know, you can go to companies in all parts of the world I and mean, they usually are thinking a little bit around A-B experimentation. They might've even made some attempts at building out a platform. I'm very excited to yeah. be kind of driving, being part of driving this third age of experimentation where now it's like a pretty mainstream, like norm where, you know, the, the question now becomes like, if you're a, if you have a hundred thousand sample size, like you're a consumer company or some PLG SaaS company, it's a bigger question mm -hmm. of like, why aren't you running experiments than otherwise? This is incredibly aided by the changes in technology where now there's just a lot more companies that are doing things like continuous release cycles, deploying through cloud infrastructure, hosting their analytics on a cloud data warehouse or some kind of on-prem local database thing. Mm -hmm. Still, of course, more deployment of that to go, but there's been quite a lot more adoption of cloud infra in a way that makes the entire experiment process much faster. Yeah. I remember I talked to like company, they want to build their own A-B testing tool. And then they, I asked them how many people on their team, they're like, oh, we just have one engineer. I think a lot of people just um, underestimate how much effort you need to put in to build A-B testing tools. How do you make sure the ran randomization is done correctly, right? How do you calculate the, those metrics? How do you deal with outliers? So there's a lot of uh, nuances in it. This gets into, when I think of companies going down the build route, as I did multiple times in my career, mm -hmm. like a big judgment is just like, how serious are you on this experiment effort? Is yeah. it something where you're going to stand up a, a, a full team or are you just trying to run like one or two experiments? It's probably a good idea to get started with something simple as you're just kind of developing conviction on this process, but just know that al almost every single result that comes out of a sort of duct tape and glue in-house tool, unless you really know what you're doing, like it, it likely comes with an asterisk of some sort. And I say mm -hmm. that just because I've gone into so many startups that had some in-house tool and then little did they know that like the, the randomization wasn't really unbiased. I've yeah. come across companies that they randomize by the last digit in the user ID and mm -hmm. put that into new groups and think, oh, that's, isn't that random? But the problem is that long ago, someone did something similar and the entire cohort of users ending in zero is actually permanently damaged in some way <laughs> that will show up on an A-B test. Like it's, yeah. they are forever sort of limited to the power users because sometime back in the day, a bad product kind of went out to the zero digit people. Oh. So there are little things like that. And then also just yeah. the way you're assigning user IDs, maybe it's not so random as you think. Mm -hmm. So yeah, exactly. uh, what, what I always encourage people to do is if you're running, if you're trying to do it yourself, at least take your setup structure, your randomization structure, and just look at those groups in the past and see if they actually lined up Yeah. You know, or run a fresh A test, an A test mm -hmm. where no new thing is launched. Like just right. convince yourself that you are actually producing two comparable groups. That's at least one way to avoid like the worst of the pitfalls. And then on the analysis side, 
the, the topics we talked about, make sure you have statistical power, make sure you're using stats appropriately and not going on fishing expeditions of metrics. Yeah. And now A-B testing is also a crucial part of ML ops. And uh, in today, there are a lot of generative AI products. So what are something specific we should think about when we're testing um, AI or gen AI models? Yeah, this is a really exciting time with gen AI. I think uh, yeah. anyone who's been working in ML and AI for a while, it's wow, what a crazy step forward. The, the, the cool... The things about Gen AI that I think are pretty interesting is you and I both worked in machine learning and yeah. in the old world of MLOps, there was a lot of curating a ton of data infrastructure. There was a lot of getting these data sets together and being able to put run these sorts of model trainings on it. There's quite a lot of work there. Nowadays, you can get like a fully formed, like highly capable Gen AI system off the shelf. And not only that, but you're going to get continuously more of them that you basically put in zero work to actually develop. And you can yeah. immediately start spitting prompts at it to see and see what comes out. So like the, mm -hmm. the time to actually deploying a valuable model has gone way down, That's but the, the drawback is so many of these gen AI models, they are not producing numbers and scores in the way all the old school ML models were. They are producing sentences and images and stuff like that. Yeah. And so that makes it really tough to evaluate. How do you decide that some chat GPT model is outperforming some llama model or that some open source mm -hmm. model might be worth considering or anything like that? Like, how do you consider that two models are one is better than the other when all they're doing is producing sentences? This is a very tricky thing. And so what we are seeing is that Gen AI models are just really accelerating the need for more AV experimentation infrastructure, because mm -hmm. that's kind of the only way to know whether one model outperforms another is against the business metric, against the number they can characterize in terms of variance and confidence intervals and stuff like that. So I think there's some people thinking creatively around how do you give that same sense of local testing, local optimization before you do the rollout with the AV test. I haven't seen anyone kind of fully get their arms around it yet. Uh, but until then, we are really leaning on the A-B test to sort out which models are actually going to drive business value versus otherwise. Yeah. What are some updates in Apple? What's something you're excited about in the next few months? Yeah, definitely. So the from our side, we had a few big launches. First of all, was our Apple reports that we spoke a lot about today. Again, mm -hmm. like we think a lot about driving experimentation culture and not just experiment automation and make sure that we reduce the statistical theater to zero. And so yeah. we're very excited to both create a sort of consistency around reports that is visually compelling, it's gonna help everyone get promoted while still being tethered to a truthful process, a trustworthy process. So that's one very big one. Others are, we are rolling out hold up, holdouts. So that's another way of getting a trustworthy oh. measure of an entire Thanks. program. So we think that's pretty important if you have the sample size to pull it off. So it's, it's a, it's very important for leaders to be able to know some total, how did we think of this entire practice and its impact on the world? And then we have a lot more kind of collaboration, social features coming out in the future. So I'll make sure I come back on with you once we uh, have some of that rolling out. Awesome. Yeah, that would be exciting. Um, thank you for coming back to the show again, Che. It was great to talk about statistical theater and thanks for providing all your um, advice um, to help data scientists uh, adopt best practices in their experimentation. Awesome. It's great being here. Thank you, Daliana.